Okie doke, right, bear with me. Let me just sort out my slides for you all. Right, can you see those slides in the right mode? Yes, thank yes. you. Yes, fantastic, that's a good start. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, can you hear me okay as well? All good. Yeah, all good. Um, right, so hello, I'm EJ. I'm a consultant at Action Sustainability. So my specialist kind of area of expertise is in modern slavery, human rights, sustainable procurement. And I'm project manager for this piece of work that we're looking at at the moment, which is all around developing guidance for the responsible sourcing of solar PV with a particular focus on forced labor. So more about that, of course, that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, so Action Sustainability is leading the project. We're seen as global leaders in sustainable procurement and supply chain management. We've been specialists in this area since 2005, I think. We led the UK and Australian delegations in developing the international standards for sustainable procurement and the new British standard guidance around modern slavery in the UK as well. So these are some of the clients that we work with in their response to combating modern slavery in their own operations and their supply chain. So you can probably see a few familiar names on here. So we've got some house builders, some main contractors, but also some of the London boroughs as well, City of London, um, Westminster and so on. This particular project that we're working on has been funded by these organisations, so National Grid, you've got your big infrastructure clients, some SMEs, house builders, and again, we've got City of London and City of Westminster, who have been talking to us for the last two years around what do we do around this issue around solar panels and potential forced labour. Okay, so... I'm happy, oh, I forgot to say I'm happy for the slides to be shared as well. So, um, and you've got the recording, so you don't need to kind of take any notes. So I'm going to just kick off by talking a little bit about the issue and the challenge, and then I'll get on to, well, what is it we're doing and what's going to be published? So we hear about net zero all the time. You guys know that better than anyone. So climate change is clearly, it's an urgent environmental issue, understatement, I suppose. But what's often forgotten or sometimes ignored maybe, is that it's not just an, an urgent environmental issue, but it's also a human rights issue as well. So this is where that phrase just transition comes in. I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with that, but if not, there, there are different definitions out there. But if you think of it as the idea of transitioning to net zero, but leaving nobody behind. So it's about thinking about the impact on people as well as the impact on the environment and the impact on the planet. OK, so bear, bear with me on this. So we've got this huge increase in countries and organisations committing to net zero, huge demand for renewable energy. It's not going away. Solar, quite rightly so, is one of the key solutions to mitigating climate change. Yet one of the challenges here is that the supply chains of most renewable energy systems have been associated with these negative human rights impacts, thinking about workers and the communities. I think the first time I heard about this in solar was probably about two and a half years ago. And then there was a report published, um, which you can see here in broad daylight, which was published in May 2021 by um, Sheffield Hallam University. And this report exposed how the solar industry in partic is particularly vulnerable to forced labour, which is, of course, a form of modern slavery. And it looks at how this is ingrained in pretty much the entire solar supply chain. So going to talk to you today about the work we're doing on this, um, but bearing in mind it's the particular focus on the forced labour side of things. So before we do anything else, I'm going to get you to do some work. Um, if you've got your phone to hand, grab your phone and go to, go to just go onto the internet and go to menti.com. You don't need to download any apps. I'm a bit of a technophobe. It's really simple. Um, just go to menti.com or if you've got two screens on the go. And then once you go to menti.com, it will prompt you for a code. So just pop in that code that's there. It's 18996753. I wonder if Saeed or Catherine, you could just copy that and pop it into the chat for me because I'm about sure. to change screens. Is that OK? Yeah. Right, so I'm going to change my screens. It does say it's not open yet. So yeah. Right. yeah, it's about to be opened any second. So present. Oh, you've seen the answer. 
that wasn't meant to happen. <laughs> okay, so there you go. It's all anonymous. We've got a fish and a bird here. That's brilliant. Um, what's going to happen is a question is going to appear on the screen, and then I want you to respond using your phones. Um, I'm guessing most of you will get this right because you may have just seen the, the answer there. So we've got 14. So a few of you still not got in, so I'll just give you another moment. So if you look in the, here we go, um, you go to menti.com and then the code is 18996753. Okay, so question will appear on the screen and then you just respond using your phone. So, and this is just to get you thinking. According to the Global Slavery Index, which was published yesterday, how many victims of modern slavery are there globally to the nearest million? Do you think 40 million, 21 million, 50 million or 63 million? What do we think? OK, so most of you thought it was higher than it actually is. So 50 million, I mean, mind boggling numbers, right? Huge numbers. And this is only the most extreme form of exploitation. So this is where victims are trapped. They're unable to leave a situation which they were um, tricked or, or forced into. Of those 50 million, the estimates are that about 28 million of those are in forced labour. OK, so let's have a look at the next question. What's the value of at-risk solar panel imports by G20 countries? By at risk, I mean at risk of forced labour. 14.8 billion, 12.7 billion or 7.4 billion? Oh, it hasn't. It hasn't come up with a response. Sorry, I forgot to do that as a, as a quiz. Um, yes, you've got that right, seven of you. That, that's great. So that that's the actual... Um, that's the actual response there. And other high risk areas are electronics, garments, textiles, palm oil. To be honest, there's forced labor in so many things, um, but those are some of the kind of key areas. Okay, so we're gonna go on to the next question. Oh. Which country do you think the report in broad daylight focused in on? reforced labour and solar PV? Was it China, Vietnam or Malaysia? I'm guessing you probably all get this right. Yes, it's China. So the issue here, for those of you who, who may not know, apologies if some of you are already very up to, up to speed on this. The issue um, that was highlighted in broad daylight was around the Xinjiang Uyghur, uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region of China. So it's the, the far kind of west where what you have is the Uyghur Muslims and Kazakhs have been placed into state-run re-education camps. They're badged as re-education camps, that's what they're called. Um, but there are plenty of reports and allegations that these are actually forced labour camps. So very similar to the kind of concentration camps, there's allegations of forced sterilisation, forced, uh, there's rape, physical abuse, forced labour. And back in 2022, last year, the UN issued a report declaring the situation there as, as crimes against humanity. And the way it works is many businesses in the whole of that Xinjiang region of China use the forced labour camps. Some, sometimes they're, they're made to use the forced labour camps by the Chinese government, but solar is one of the big risk areas. Also, interestingly, Xinjiang is one of the areas that has a lot of coal. OK, so the key risk component in the solar PV supply chain it's the polysilicon so bearing in mind that I think it's about 95 percent of the world's solar PV contains polysilicon so bearing that in mind what percentage of polysilicon is produced in the Uyghur region of China what do you think is it 22 percent 45 percent 81 percent or 12 what do we think OK, um, yeah, 60 of you, you got that right. It's um, it's 45 percent. So huge risk there. However, there's an additional 30 percent of um, polysilicon that comes from China, not from the Uyghur region, but that's also likely to be tainted with forced labour because typically as a commodity, polysilicon it all gets mixed together so it's very difficult to say there's no forced labor in this and there is in that one also people in those forced labor camps are often forced to go and work elsewhere in China so that's just getting us thinking a little bit about about the issue what's actually going on when we're talking about the challenges here so 
let me just sort my screens out again. Oh, hold on. Okay. Okie doke. So, um, and this is just a little infographic here, um, like I say, that came out um, two days ago from the Global Slavery Index. And look what's on the front cover, solar panels. Um, yeah, I was quite surprised to see that. Not that surprised, but um, interesting to see that, that that was what was chosen. Okay, so solar clearly isn't going away. You've got this steady increase in intelligence that reveals all these potential human rights issues in its supply chain. So there's growing pressure on organizations to get that supply chain transparency and try to demonstrate that they're doing everything they can to combat, mod combat modern slavery in their international supply chains. Um, you know, in the UK, some of the public sector have actually put solar panel procurement on hold because they're saying, well, we can't guarantee it doesn't have forced labor in it. You know, I'm not sure that's definitely the right way forward because at the moment it's pretty difficult for anybody to claim that there's no forced labor in this, in their solar panels, part of the challenge, which we'll look at in a minute. So against this, you've got this um, huge tsunami of due diligence legislation happening worldwide that's looking at, at modern slavery, as well as the wider sustainability issues. Something there on the bottom right you've got, um, which is the Uyghur Forced Labour Prevention Act. That's a piece of legislation that came out in the US that says that any goods manufactured or processed in that Xinjiang region of China are not allowed into the US unless they can prove that there are no links to those forced labor camps, which is very difficult. So at the moment, we have a situation where there's solar PV, there's textiles, there's other things that are being stockpiled at the border because they're not allowed in. You've got all sorts of due, dil due diligence legislation worldwide that's putting in fines at times for organizations who can't demonstrate that they're working with their supply chain to combat these issues. I think I saw in the news that Amazon were being, um, well, potentially fined up to 2% of their global turnover for um, not showing due diligence in looking at health and safety issues in some of their factories overseas. So this, this is coming. Um, there's big kind of industry drivers out there, as well as that reputational risk, I suppose, thinking outside of solar. Okay, so thinking about solar, um, what's the challenge? From a procurement perspective, if you put, I don't know if we've got any procurement people in the room today, um, interested to hear if we have, but if you put yourselves in the, in the shoes of, of somebody who's responsible for buying solar, what on earth do you do? There's a huge lack of knowledge around the solar supply chain. It's really complex. You have all sorts of issues there. And, and one of the simple barriers there is that you can't actually go and audit China. You cannot do any social audits in China anyway. Um, and polysilicon is, is like chocolate or cobalt when you think it's a, it's a commodity where things all get shoved together. So trying to get that traceability can be near on impossible sometimes. You've got the environmental and human rights issues associated with alternatives to solar. Um, so, you know, thinking about what I said about some of the UK um, government have, some of the public sector bodies have put a stop to solar procurement because of this issue, but they're probably still buying electric vehicle, vehicles and all these other things that, as we all know, have issues to do with um, forced labour and, you know, horrendous human rights issues in those supply chains in places like Democratic Republic of the Congo. So, you know, it's a real challenge. Then you've got this piece around, you know, if your traditional procurement methods and I suppose compliance driven methods won't, won't you can't, you, they're not going to tackle this issue properly. Um, sometimes procurement people think, well, I'll buy a certain standard or something with a sp specific accreditation. They're, we're not there in, in when, you, uh, when we're thinking about solar PV, but it's not as simple as that. Um, I would almost see that as I call it risk dumping on the supply chain. So, oh, well, it's your issue. Just make sure you get it, get something accredited. Just because something has an accreditation doesn't always mean to say you don't have to look under the bonnet and see what's going on. Um, so yeah, from a procurement perspective, there needs to be a much more strategic approach and look at opportunities to collaborate and increase leverage, I suppose. I was talking to one of the big house builders the other week and they were saying, but EJ, we buy all our solar PV in the region. So for every development we have, we'll have somebody who's buying solar there. 
so we have very little influence there's nothing we can do and you know we were talking about well potentially if you would consider buying them centrally you would be able to have a little bit more leverage there okay so the guidance itself so what are we doing so we'll be publishing it's free freely available to anyone at all which will provide best practice procurement and supply chain advice to help tackle this due diligence in responsible sourcing of solar panels so the guidance will be focusing so the guidance is for anybody who's involved in or influences the procurement of solar panels so it could be from your big solar farms right down to small installers different approach though um, will be recommended through the guidance which I'm sure you're thinking lots of different issues there around very little leverage if you're an SME so we'll come on to that so it's focusing in on solar panels but the thinking is the content and advice provided could be transferable and actually could be used to support responsible sourcing strategies for for other categories of spend so the guidance itself it's not going to be an academic document um, I'm not an academic I like simple speak practical things so the, the guidance itself it will provide a summary of what the challenge is you know high level overview of the the renewable energy market and solar market insights into what these issues are environmental and human rights issues but also uh, uh, linking to solar and solar alternatives also thinking about the human rights and environmental issues throughout the life cycle okay so we are thinking about biodiversity um you know all the issues to do with waste at end of life and so on it will cover the legislative landscape and potential future impact we'll be signposting to collaborative initiatives that are already underway to address these issues what we don't want to do is you know bulldoze in there and reinvent the wheel we're we've done a lot of desktop research i think about 80 publications we've we've looked through we've engaged with probably about 100 stakeholders through interviews and workshops so we're signposting to existing initiatives um, and and recommending people to use those initiatives where they're already in play but the key i suppose the meat of the guidance is top tips and practical how-to guidance on how to develop and implement procurement strategies so everything from how to map solar panel supply chains how to manage the risk um, the role of collaboration tools techniques templates that can be used that you to support the procurement of solar. So things like, um, in a simple way of thinking, things like uh, pre-qualification questions, tendering and maturity frameworks, contract inclusions, metrics, checklists for supply chain data requests. Um, so making it as easy as possible. We're also going to be having a section that looks at how to almost procure auditors. So if you're looking to get auditors, how, what should what should you be looking for how do you know they are a good auditor so it's all about things like that as well but the approach that we're using will be determined by what leverage you have so again thinking back if you're a solar farm you've got huge leverage um, if you're a solar farm you should be looking to collaborate across industry and government engage with the supply chain to set expectations of transparency disclosure think about all those life cycle impacts and opportunities that you can where you can reduce unethical labor um, looking at establishing innovation funds and so on whereas if you're a smaller organization um, an installer with minimum leverage it's almost about setting that level of expectation with your suppliers okay you know let's think about simple questions that we can ask our supply chain to start that conversation and dialogue but the leverage that they have will be very different so it's providing that tailored approach and then hopefully the support that will help them um, to progress what it won't be doing it's not going to be here's a list of clean suppliers um, I know all the um, procurement people we work with were saying wouldn't that be great that's not what we're doing it's not about saying don't work with this country it's about forced labor and labor exploitation due diligence it's the process and the tools to do your best to minimize this um the risk of, of this um the impact of forced labor so and it's also not a case of use it and you can be assured that there's no forced labor or modern slavery in your supply chains we can't do that um, it's guidance so it's not providing all the answers 
So I think I'm just thinking, ah, what else? So I've got this slide as well. So key principles really are that due diligence is the responsibility of the ultimate client. So it's not about that. That's what good due diligence is. It's not about risk dumping and just kind of putting it, oh, it's my supply chain. They need to sort it. Um, we've talked about leverage and about how the guide will be looking at due diligence in the solar life cycle. So don't worry about the rubbish design of this. It won't look like this in the final guidance, but it's just to show we're, we're focusing in on forced labour and labour exploitation, but we'll also be touching on all of these sustainability issues as well in the guidance. So people are aware it's a holistic, they need to be thinking about all these sustainability issues. And I think that's it for now. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, EJ, thank you. If you're all there, nobody's asleep yet. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I think you've got quite a rapt, attentive audience here, Abby.